Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we would look at the revenue cycle. The revenue cycle is one of six cycles that we need to learn about whether you are a CPA candidate or an accounting information student or you are taking an audit course or studying for the CPA exam, the auditing section. And those are the revenue cycle, the expenditure cycle, the financing cycle, production or manufacturing, HR and payroll, reporting and general and ledger. In this session, we'll focus only on one session, and this is the revenue cycle. We'll focus on the revenue cycle. So what is revenue, just in case we don't know what revenue is? It's what the company does on a day-to-day -day basis to generate assets, usually account receivable, then transfer that receivable into cash by either providing services or selling goods or both or either or or manufactured goods. Sometimes you could be a manufacturing company where you have to manufacture the good first, like you have a production cycle, then the production cycle will feed into the revenue cycle. And sometimes you're just a retailer and there is no production cycle. You basically buy and sell the material. Now, revenue encompasses or touches, touches many aspects of the company. And we looked at this in the prior session when we looked at introduction to the accounting information cycle. Basically, if we are a manufacturing company, we have to start manufacturing the product. Then the manufacturing process will send the items or will notify the revenue that the items are ready to be sold. The revenue cycle will help sell the goods and services. And this is what we study the process in this cycle right here. Then the revenue will provide funding to the financing cycle, will provide information to the general ledger about the sales. Now bear in mind that the production cycle also gets information or data from the expenditure cycle, such as the purchase of raw material comes from the expenditure cycle, operating expenses, it's supported by the expenditure cycle. And also the production process needs HR and payroll. So simply put, if you notice, HR and payroll feeds into the production, the expenditure cycle feeds into the production, the production cycle feeds into the revenue cycle, the revenue cycle finance the company, and the revenue cycle will send data to the general ledger and reporting. So if you notice, practically the revenue touches every aspect of the company. Now it's very important to go back and review what we know from a journal entry perspective, because in this session, we're going to be focused on focusing on the operating section. But if we can go through some journal entries, just to remember, to refresh our memory, it will make our life easy. First, we might, we might, we make sales on account. For example, we sold 50,000 worth of goods and services, and I'm going to assume we're selling on account receivable, it could be cash, but we want to make the process a little bit more interesting. Debit account receivable, credit sales. Now, also, if we manufacture the product or if we purchased it, we're going to debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory. This is for sale. And if life is good, we would receive the money. We debit cash, credit account receivable. If life is perfect, this is this is the whole revenue cycle. We sell on account, then we receive cash. But that's not what really happens. In the real world, we might have sales return. Customers might return some items. So we have to process the returns. And at the end of the period, if we still have receivables, we know that we cannot collect 100%. We have to estimate the bad debt. And eventually we might have to also write off accounts. So notice this is basically the revenue cycle from A to Z. This is it. Now we're going to look at it from an operating perspective. From an operating perspective, the revenue cycle starts with a sales, or with sales order and ends with cash collection. That's basically how it works. I'm going to go ahead and break the sales process into seven steps. The first step is actually receiving a sales order. The second step is granting credit. Once we grant the credit, we deliver or ship the goods or the services to the customers. Then we build the customer. We invoice the customer. Then we process and record the cash receipts, assuming we sold it on account. And this is what we are assuming here. Then we process and record any sales return, if any. Then we write, uh, we write off accounts and estimate bad debt. And remember, basically, this is basically the typical process. Now, sometimes you may have to write off an account before a sales return, but to a great degree, this is how it works. Now, what I'm going to do in this session is identify the risks and control in each of these steps. And so obviously, we have seven steps. And if you know anything about me, I'm going to go ahead and put 
each step on a separate slide and identify the documents involved. Now, I am not going to show you the documents involved, whether it's a sales order, bill of lading, remittance advice. What I suggest you do, if you're not familiar, just Google it and see what the document would look like because it's going to make the learning easier. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. Starting with the sales order, which is step one. Nothing will happen until we have a sales order. Well, we're gonna process the customer orders. That customer order could come in via email, telephone, fax, phone, um, web application, walk-in, etc. It doesn't matter. We need a sales order. We need to start the process. So the document here is we have a sales order. Now the sales order should be pre-numbered, pre-printed, and accounted for. What does that mean? I'm going to keep repeating this. Pre-number, it's good for reconciliation. Simply put, if we know we have 100 sales order, and of those 100, 20 are used, we know which 20 because we can identify them. We know we have 80 remaining. So we have to reconcile, making sure the 20 that are used are, are appropriate, appropriately used and we have 80. So we have to account for those. That's what we mean by pre-numbered. And pre-printed basically have the company name on it. Maybe sometime the product that we sell, if it's a few product, and basically maybe we can check those product. This way it's pre-printed. There's the quantity, place, price, so on and so forth and accounted for or reconciled basically says at the end of the period make sure we account for everything to make sure whatever is not used is not being misused someone is not issuing sales order and we don't we cannot account for because everything has to be serial has a serial number think about your checkbook your checks are pre-numbered so this way you would know if you wrote a check if you have 100 checks and you wrote one you know you should still have 99 but if those checks are not pre-numbered, you don't know how many you have. You don't know which one are used. You don't know which one are not used. So that's why it's very important to know the importance of the pre-numbered documents. What departments are involved in this process? Well, we're going to send one of the sales order. We're going to send it to the shipping department, one to the billing, and one to the accounting. Now, not I mean, those sales order, they're going to be approved first but the point is the sales order where it's one that's going to go to shipping billing and accounting so more people are involved what are the risks in this process in this step the risk is completeness not all sales are processed some somehow we fail to process the whole sale or the existence of actual sales what if we are processing sales for fake customers to increase our sales those are the risks in this step the controls are verification of customer existence we want to make sure, for example, the customer sub submits some document for verification. In the IT section, we'll talk about more controls such as field checks. For example, when the customer complete an order, we want to make sure we have all the information. You know, the transaction doesn't go through until everything, all the boxes are complete and the appropriate characters are included. And this helps with the completeness test. Step one. Step two, basically step one and step two are related because after we receive a sales order, now here we are assuming we are selling on credit. The issue here is, is the customer approved for credit sales? Is the proper authority granting the credit? Because very important to only sell to credit, to credit worthy and credit approved customers and customers that we want to deal with. Okay, what documents are involved here? Approved sales order. The sales order gonna turn into an approved one. And who's gonna get this? Sales, the sales department, the inventory warehouse, the shipping people, the billing, and inventory control. And those are all to be discussed later. Now, when I said these guys received them in the prior on the prior slide, basically what they're looking for for the approved for the approved sales order. Because if the sales order is not approved, there's no sale, therefore they don't receive any of it. But the point I was trying to make, let's assume it's approved, 
That's why I mentioned them there. What are the risks here? The risk is selling to not credit worthy customers if we skip this step or if this step was not properly followed. Selling to customers without checking their credits, that could be a problem. We could have delinquent accounts, accounts that we cannot collect. We're gonna have problem collecting our money in the future. This could affect our, our valuation for the account receivable. So how should you mitigate this risk? Segregation of duties. People that issue the credits, that should not be under the risks, should, this should be under the control. Seg segregation of duties. People that grant credit should not be people that make the sales because people that make the sales have every incentive to, to approve your credit. I remember when I was in college, I used to work in a place called, I'm not sure if it exists or not, Baskovs. It's in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure if it's in other states. It's a retail store. And basically, um, I used to work in the shoe department. I would sell shoes. And if I sold shoes, I don't remember the commission. Was it $2 or I don't remember. Oh, no, it was $2 for every credit I opened and there was a commission for the sales. I'm, I don't remember what it was, but there was a commission for selling shoes. Okay, they want, you know, they, they will motivate you. I, I don't remember, I just, I can't. But I know from opening credit, it was $2. Uh, so basically, um, to open the credit, obviously I wanted everyone to be granted the credit because I will get $2. But if Boscovs allow me to grant credit to everyone, I have no risk. I will grant them the credit, get the $2, and maybe they will buy the shoes. There will be an extra commission as well. But the point is, the people that approve the credit should not be the salespeople. Okay? No, and no sale should be made prior to credit approval. You should have a policy where no sale, every sale will have to go through a credit approval. Now, this credit approval could be automated. For example, I remember at the Boscovs or at stores these days, if you go to, to open a credit, last time I was at Best Buy, I was trying to buy actually a, a, a laptop. And what they did is basically they, they started the application and I filled everything on, uh, on a tablet, just inputted my social security, date of birth, my address, and we waited and I was approved. So... I was approved obviously by a computer no one was there on the other end but the point is the credit approval does uh, the the person that's selling cannot approve your credit that's the whole point point. and some companies what they do outsource the whole process we use visa visa and credit card is basically outsourcing the credit process because you are you are letting visa the banks that's issuing the visa and the credit card worry about this credit approval process and taking the credit risk so this is the granting the credit now that's an important step shipping the goods assuming the the sales are approved now we ship the good now remember the shipping department or the shipping people they already have a sales order and an approved sales order just what we care about is the approved sales order remember that's prerequisite in other words they already have this so the inventory warehouse pulls the goods and forward them using something called a picking picking list now everything highlighted in yellow those are documents and this is what they're going to be testing you on so make sure you know what they are the picking list list of items to be picked and packaged now a company like amazon believe it or not in many of their warehouses a robot pick the items pick the items from the warehouse so the robot the whole process is automated okay and only the goods that belong to the sales order should be picked now the shipping person the shipping clerk prepares a packing slip again a pack there's a packing slip and a picking slip list of items to be shipped so basically they will just basically this this packing slip is coming from the sales approve order so this is basically a verification process now they look at the sales order they will prepare a packing slip make sure make sure the packing slip matches with the approved sales order matching with the picking slip match the sales order and the picking slip together then we prepare what's called bill of lading or lading now this is important this is the document then when you open your amazon box you will see it you will see something was shipped to you sent with the shipment it's basically a contract outlining the allocation of res the responsibilities between the parties and here we could have oftentimes three parties the buyer the seller and the shipper the shipper could be like ups or or uh, or some other party, a United States Postal Service, it could be any, any company, so a shipping company. So that's the bill of lading. The bill of lading is important because it has the date of the shipment, which is, it helps with the cutoff period. When was the, when did the sale took place? And also depending on the terms of the sale, whether it's FOB shipping, FOB destination, make sure you know what a bill of lading is. 
Now we ship the goods to the customers. Okay, documents in this process are also pre-numbered pre -numbered and accounted for. I know I don't have to tell you this, but I'm gonna keep saying this, it's important. Now also billing and accounting would receive copies of these of these uh, of the shipping which is picking uh, packing and copy of the bill of lading that it we, we indeed ship the product now sometimes this whole process is automated electronic shipping document may generate the related sales invoice and entries in the sales journal so this whole process in some companies could be automated what is the risk in, in this step the risk is shipping the wrong product to the customer what is the control verification process like the shipping clerk verifying the picking list, the packing list, and the approved sales order, or using technology such as barcode or RFID that make sure everything is matched properly because computer, once it's programmed properly, it should not make any mistakes. That's the benefit of automated system. Now from the shipping, once we ship the goods, now we move to the billing and the accounting process. Here, the billing and the accounting process should have a packing list, bill of lading, and approved sales order. What did they do? They match all three and prepare a multi-part invoice, which is a sales invoice, and they build the client. Now we have a new document, a sales invoice. This sales invoice, we, uh, the customer gets one, and the accounting department will have one. Billing, this process is important, this, this step, because it's, it, has, it does the matching of the shipping, the order, the invoice, also check for arithmetic, pricing, discounts, so on and so forth. Here we wanna make sure all shipment are billed, there's a completeness, everything is. So if we have a shipping document, we wanna make sure we build the client. Think about if we ship something and we don't build the client, it could happen. No shipment has been, no shipment has been built more than once. So we don't, we don't wanna ship the client, more, the client more than once, occurrence. It happened once, no more than once. And each customer is built for the proper amount. Here we want to make sure we are accurate. So that's why it's important in this step. So an account receivable is created based on the matching documents received from the various sources and the sales journal is updated at this point. The, the goods are shipped and the customer is billed. Now we can tell the customer to pay us. What are the risks here? Uh, one of the risks I already mentioned, you failure to build the customer. We shipped it, but somehow the paperwork are lost. And <laughs> let me tell you, the customer is not gonna call you for that. Okay, or we build, the wrong, we build them for the wrong amount. That could be a problem too. And if we build them for the wrong amount, sometimes the customers don't call if you underbill them. They're not gonna complain about this. What are the control process here? Reconciliation process. Make sure you are matching. You are matching the, the approved sales order to the packing slip, to the bill of lading. Everything is being matched. Everything is properly recorded. Reconciliation process. After we build the client, now it's time to receive the cash. The risk here is theft. The cash don't make it to the company. What are the control here? Logbox system is an alternative or electronic fund transfer. Rather than receiving money, let the customer send the money to a logbox system, for example, to the bank, and the bank will deposit the money immediately in the bank account and give us, tell us who paid and will give them credit. Or electronic fund transfer, it's easier. Here, segregation of duties is very important. For example, if you are receiving checks in the mail, well, once the checks are received, more than one person should open the mail. They should be stamped immediately as, as for deposit only, okay? And we want to encourage the customer to submit a remittance advice. And usually we send them that and the customer send it back to us indicating how much they paid. And if, none ask, if, not, if no remittance advice is sent, the person that opened the mail, they should have a list of all the customer names that paid with the total the name and the total for the day, and the cash should be separate. So those two should be separate. Pre-listing of cash receipts prepared with someone with no record keeping responsibilities. So people that list the names and have access to the cash should not have access to the record, okay? We verify that the cash was received. Then what we do, we notify the accounting department, the people that have access to the record to update the record of each account receivable from the names of these of the people that paid and the and update the general accounting now the cash goes to a cashier which have no accounting capabilities at this process remember people with access to assets should not have access to the records those two should always be separate so if we have the names of the people that pay that's fine, and at some point we might also have access to the cash, but we cannot change the record. So we have access to the record, we should not have access to the cash. People that have access to the cash should 
have access to the cash should not be able to change the record. Someone else should change the record. So the cashier will have access to the cash. The account receivable can update the record. Always custody of assets and, and the record keeping, those two should be separate. Okay, in some textbook, they call it ARC, you know. Asset and record keeping should be separate. Sales returns and allowances. Sometimes customers are not happy. They would re they would return the items. If they do so, the company should prepare prepare a receiving report again, pre-numbered or serially numbered, for goods returned, and put them in storage. If they are still in good shape, they need to be inspected. Record the sales return allowances in the transaction file as well as in the account receivable. Update the account receivable for that customer. Don't build them again. Create a credit memo or issue a credit memo to make sure we have a record of what happened and to facilitate record keeping. We gave the client a credit for that. Therefore, we reduced their account receivable to support the reduction in the account receivable. What are the risks in this step here? Fake returns, people are not, they're not really making a return. Someone is helping them, giving them credit or theft. Simply put, stuff are being returned. We are writing it off and someone is stealing it. Control, segregation of duties. People that have access to the assets, that receive the asset, you should not give them any incentive. You should not give them record, record keeping capability and opportunity to steal it. Therefore, they have no incentive to do so. Segregation of duties is important. Automate the process. Um, have internal control cameras so on and so forth step seven in the in the in the process is writing off accounts and estimating bad debt and hopefully you don't want that to happen but that's part of the selling on credit in collectible authorization they should be all, all serially numbered pre-numbered so every time we write off an account the appropriate party here can issue the credit or can not the credit can issue the write-off based on the company's guidelines whatever those guidelines are but someone is following the guidelines and that person they have no incentive you don't give them the opportunity and incentive to be to be able to write off the account if they already made the sale made the sales themselves and they have access to the assets for example the guidelines could be if the customer is bankrupt over 180 days uh, once it's turned to collection agency whatever our guidelines are they should follow the guidelines and companies cannot expect to receive 100 percent on all their sales on credit that's important so what they have to do they have to comply with the matching principle this means you have to estimate that debt at the end of each month at the end of each quarter and you have to update your general journal to make sure those figures are reflected what are the risks here again it's either theft on a personal level for the uh, for the write-off of accounts you would write off the account and keep the money or overstating of assets your account receivable should be written down and you're keeping it. Control, segregation of duties. People that should be able to write off these accounts, they should have no incentive. You should not give them incentive or opportunity to be able to commit fraud. And regular review of account receivable. A third person, independent person, should review account receivable on a regular basis to make sure our assets are not overstated. What should you do now? Go to Farhat Lectures and work MCQs. In the next session, we would look at the other, I believe would look at the expenditure cycle. Stay motivated, good luck, study hard. The CPA exam is worth it and stay safe.